In this R tutorial, we're going to be discussing how to do chi-square goodness of fit tests, chi-square tests of homogeneity and independence, and then also how to run hypothesis tests on the true population slope for a set of bivariate data. So first thing we're going to look at is the chi-square goodness of fit test. Now remember, you recognize chi-square goodness of fit tests when you see just one-way tables, or you're just looking to see if a distribution of a single variable matches what you expected. So the first thing I'm going to do is look at my Austin City Limits data. This is a set of data that is taking a sample of artists who have played at Austin City Limits live at the Moody Theater over the past 10 years. So if you look at this, I have artist's name, the year they played, the month, the season, their gender, their age, their age group, whether or not they won a Grammy, their genre, if they, or if they did not, hit the Billboard Top 10, uh, the number of Twitter followers they have at that time, and whether or not they hit the 100,000 uh, follower mark on Twitter, and then same thing for Facebook, and if they hit, whether or not they hit the 100,000 uh, 100, follower mark on Facebook. So zero means they didn't, one means they did. So the first question I could ask about this is, have one-third of ACL Live artists won a Grammy? Now, I could obviously calculate that for my sample, but assuming my sample is random representative of the population, I could run a test to determine whether I have evidence to claim that it is not, in fact, what I expect, or if I default to what it is, what I expect. So. In this particular thing, I'm going to first create a table that I'm going to just name Grammy Table. And when I do that, all I want to look at is whether or not they won a Grammy, so yes or no. So I go in and I create table using the function table of Austin City Limits. You may have already named this ACL or something uh, shorter, which is fine. Dollar sign the variable Grammy. Now I have uh, parentheses around this because if I didn't have parentheses, all it would do is just store the thing in Grammy Table and I wouldn't actually have uh, the table show up. So I could type Grammy table again and get it to show up, or I could just stick parentheses around it and run the whole line, and it'll do both. It'll run the table and store it, but then also show me the table. So if you see here, I've got 49 of the artists have won a Grammy and 67 have not. So what I'm gonna do now is use another vector to talk about my list of expected percentages for whether or not they won a Grammy. Well, there's only two options here, or two categories, no or yes. And I want to test here, have one third of ACL Live artists won a Grammy. So that's what I expect. Now, since it's in alphabetical order, no then yes, I have to put my percentages that way as well. So two thirds is the what I expect for no, and one third is what I expect for yes. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this vector, gram expected. And remember, you're going to have to list the values in alphabetical order, so no comes before yes. So hit run. And now I've got Grammy expected in my environment. So I'm going to use now the observed counts that I have and then the expected distribution I just put in in my chi-squared test function. But first, remember if you don't know what a function does, stick a question mark in front of that function name, and that will pull up the function's help page in R. So you see here it says you've got an x variable that must be defined, but if you don't put a y variable, it's just set to null. The correction value, this is whether or not to apply a continuity correction when computing the test statistic for two by two tables. So if you set that to false, that will turn that off and it will match what we normally do in our calculator. The only reason to keep that on is if for some reason in your own data collection, you have a condition that is not met. If you keep that turned on, it'll correct for that issue that you may have had in your conditions. Now, what we'll see today is it won't make a difference because we won't have violated our, our conditions at all. So for our purposes, we're going to keep it turned off. So we'll have to actually type correct equals false because the default is true. And then down here it says uh, P is a vector of probabilities of the same length of the variable you're giving it. And an error is given if the entry is negative because none of the expected values could be negative. But keep in mind these are all probabilities and not actual counts. So that's why here I had to have this add up to 100%. So 
So first thing I'm going to do is check my expected counts condition. I know that I have to have all of the expected counts be five or more. So I'm going to run my chi-square.test function with the variable I created. This variable is a table. The table is what I just spit out right here. Now I want my expected counts to be my gram expected vector. So I say that P, the probabilities, are equal to the gram underscore expected vector. And then at the end of that, I do dollar sign expected to get it to run the actual expected counts. And as we see here, we're definitely uh, above five. So we're good for that condition. If I take off the dollar sign expected, and then add, of course, my correct equals false like we were talking about, and run it, I'll get my chi-square test. Tells me my chi-square test statistic is 4.1422 degrees of freedom or one, because I had two categories, minus one is one. And I have a p-value of less than 5%. So based off of this, you would say that you would reject the null hypothesis that the distribution of counts for Grammy winners is equal to what we would expect, which is two-thirds no, one-third yes. So you have evidence that the distribution of Grammy winners in ACL Live Artists does not match the one-third expected proportion. Now just as a little flashback to when we did prop.test, since we only have two categories, yes or no, this is actually the same thing as doing a prop.test, which is why you actually saw the chi-square value prop up, pop up in a prop.test. So if I ran this based on what we would have done in the past, which would have been 67 out of the total, and my probability was set to two-thirds because that's what I said my expected was, correction equals false, if you run that, you get the exact same p-value and you get the chi-square value that we were talking about. This is just a different type of way of looking at a chi-square test and it would only be applicable in this situation where we had just two answers, yes or no, or two categories, say male or female, etc. So the answer here, as I just read, there is evidence to say that it does not match the one-third expected proportion. Moving on to chi-square tests of independence and homogeneity, remember this is when you have two variables that you're comparing to one another, and the difference between independence and homogeneity only comes down to the way in which you've sampled your data. So independence, once again, was where you had the entire sample, one sample was taken and the entire sample was then spread over your two variables and their categories. Homogeneity is where you're taking independent simple random samples from two or more populations and looking at a variable across all of those independent random samples to see if it's about the same. So my question here is, is artist age group associated with Grammy wins? So first thing I'm going to do is create another table, and I'm going to call it Grammy age, where I look at the Grammy yes or no categories with the age group categories. So I run this with parentheses around it, it'll store Grammy age and then also give me Grammy age table in the output. So here I've got four age categories and then a yes or no on Grammy category and I see these are all my observed counts. And if I want to go ahead and run the actual chi-square test, I need to determine is this independence or is it homogeneity. So I'd set up my null and alternative hypotheses and since my question is, is age group associated with Grammy wins, I've only taken one sample and that was this entire data set and I'm looking to spread that over the category. So this is a test of independence. So if I run my conditions here using chi-square.test, Grammy age is the table, and then I add the dollar sign expected to get my expected counts to show up. All of them are at least five or more. This one was the only one that was very close to not being true. But had this not been, been true, we still would have been able to get away with that essentially based on our other backup expected count condition. Uh, which would have meant that uh, all of them were greater than one and at least 80% of them were uh, at least five. We would have still met that. So if I take off the dollar sign expected part and I put in my correction equals false because I don't want to do that correction, continuity correction, and then I run the chi-square test, it'll give me a chi-square value of 5.5415 degrees of freedom or three. And that is because you had four categories up here, minus one, times two categories minus one is three times one, which is three. P-value was not significant. So because of that, you would fail to reject your null hypothesis and conclude that there is not sufficient evidence to say that winning a Grammy depends on the artist age group. So in this case, we would default to our null hypothesis that those must be independent. Okay, moving on to inference for regression and slope. Now, once again, this doesn't have much to do with the actual chi-square test. We're just lumping this into the same unit. 
This is when we're looking at quantitative data again, not categorical, and it's bivariate data. So we've taken a set of sample data, we've plotted it, we've put our regression line over it, and now we're wondering what is the true population slope? Where we have our sample slope, what's the true population slope? So here's my question, and I've got a different set of data I'm going to use for it. I'm going to use the uh, film data set, which has a series of films, some of which you may recognize, their studio, their genre, the year they were produced and released, and their gross income, their gross income domestically versus overseas, their Rotten Tomato score, their IMDb uh, score, and then their ratings and days in theater and budget in millions of dollars. So with all of this here, what we're going to do is look at the question proposed, which is, is there a significant correlation between IMDb rating and Rotten Tomato rating for films? In other words, are the two associated? You might think they are, because if something's rated low on IMDb, it's probably going to be rated low on Rotten Tomato. So among our conditions, besides random sample, we had to check that our residual plot showed no pattern. In other words, is a linear model appropriate to even model this data? So checking our residuals is something we've done a long time ago, so a little recap of how to do that. First off, you have to use linear model, and whenever you write linear model, you have to do the y variable tilde the x variable, so y as a function of x. And I put that into the resid function to actually give me a list of all the residuals. So if I just ran this portion right here, I would get all the residuals, all 151 of them for the 151 uh, rows in my data set. So I'm going to name that whole thing residuals, all right, so that I can refer to it without having to type this entire thing again. And I'm going to create a residual plot now. And a residual plot has, the, for our purposes, the original x uh, values on the x-axis, and then for the y-axis has the residuals. And then you can title it and put your x-label and y-label. So when you run this, here's what a residual plot looks like. And remember, white noise or no pattern is a good thing. So in this case, I don't see a discernible pattern. It just seems like a big ball of points that were thrown up. So, so far, so good. I have checked out that condition. The residual plot shows no pattern. Next, for our inference for regression and slope, is to check that the residuals are approximately normally distributed. You can do that in a variety of ways. I've put two of the ways up here. You can do a normal quantile plot using QQ norm function, or you can run a histogram and talk about how the shape looks approximately normal. So remember, if you do a QQ norm, you're putting in your series of residuals here. So I'm doing a normal quantile plot on my residuals. So I put residuals because I've already stored that. Data x is true because we want, in our purposes, the residuals on the x-axis. And then label it, and then use ylab since you flip-flop your data x uh, to read that properly. So when you run that, my normal quantile plot shows a linear pattern, which means my residuals are approximately normal. If I ran a histogram, I would have seen the same conclusion. There's a slight skew, but it's not severely away from an approximately normal distribution to say that I violate that assumption. So now I can conclude my residuals are approximately normal. The last thing to do is actually to run the regression output. And this is something that you get given a lot with the AP exam. You get given a uh, residual output and asked to interpret it. So we're going to produce that so that we can then interpret it. So again, using the same linear model set up as before, you're now going to put that into summary instead of resid. So when you run that, that gives you a whole bunch of stuff. This is really the main part that we are concerned with now. This is what we normally see, the actual y-intercept and slope of our sample data, the standard error of the y-intercept, the standard error of the slope, the t-statistic for the, the y-intercept, the t-statistic for the slope, and the p-value for the y-intercept and the p-value for the slope. So based off of this, we have an extremely small p-value, and it's coded with this triple asterisk, which means that it's less than 0 .000, essentially, so it's very small. These are the different codes that it would uh, code it with if it was meeting a certain alpha level. So based off of that, I must reject my null hypothesis. My null hypothesis was that there was no correlation between the two. Or in other words, the true population slope was zero. So if I rejected my null hypothesis, I then have evidence that there is a significant correlation between IMDB and Rotten Tomato ratings for the films.
Now that makes sense, again, based on what we thought about at the very beginning. This concludes your uh, video guide on how to do chi-square, goodness of fit, independence, homogeneity tests, as well as regression for inference and slope.